Hey guys, welcome back. Thank you for checking out the uh, tier one RP, non RP, uh, respect five um, tier list. I, I really, I always want to stress that these are my opinions. You know, there is a general consens consensus on what commanders are the best, but I think I always want to share my opinion on where I think certain tweaks or, or minor disagreements may lie, at least as far as my thoughts go. Um, so we did T1. And actually, I'll reorganize this real quick as the order of the T1 that I, I thought was relevant. I, I think that's pretty solid. It's a general rule of thumb for the non role player role play. So for Tier 2, we're going to try to go through this a little bit quicker because uh, I know I like to give gab quite a bit. I think the last one was like 20 minutes. Hmm. Um, Denethor, I think, is pretty solid where he's at. Um, he's got, this is Respect 5, this is role play. I just do not see enough there, and I've tried to use him a little bit. I just do not see enough there to not laugh at, to be perfectly frank. I mean, it's kind of a bad meme. The 40% chance after HP, deal, you know, to recover X amount and with an only HP boost of one, I think it's expensive amount of points for this. Uh, I think this is so late game, and the fact that it's only two units and not modifiable by focus, I think is kind of a joke. Fortify, not a huge fan of. To, re to require seven points to get a bonus that only applies while defending, that also only applies to just physical damage after six seasons, good luck. Most people run burns and burn in a focus, so I think that's useless. I think his R3 is interesting. The Wild Magic I like, which seems Mary Pippin. I like the fanaticism. Um, I think the Palantir Scryer is not bad. It's probably pretty decent if you get his focus high enough. Um, Mad Steward is interesting. Uh, it would just depend. Like if you're if you get into this and your units do a bunch of damage, rock and roll. But then if you use wild magic on your own guys, like I don't know, I'm always very cautious about that. Or if you use arson, if you use the arson skill, so it's like eh. And then enrage. So it's like there's interesting stuff here, but I just don't think it's enough to warrant a heavy investment. Um, and I've only seen one. I've only played with one R10 Denethor. But that being said, an R5, I just don't see enough there to warrant the investment he has extremely specific mitigation on fortify he has a very double-edged sword of mitigation for palantir scryer uh and then this, these heals are this one's to me is a low chance 40 percent, and then that one is so late game it only affects two units so you kind of have to only use two units if you want to get the full full effect of that so to me it's not worth it um uh, let's see here. Oof. I am probably going to put Emer Hill above above Denethor for the sake of his R5. So I think his bottom R0 for one point, you do just like... Um, hall deer, but you get the avoid for one point in the fair. You get an evasion next round for all units. Excuse me, you got you get initiative for all units. Um, but there's just two attack skills. It's this one and this one. So it's like, hmm, why does he have even two of these if he's a cavalry commander? You get the same Denethor tree. That once again, low chance for only 45 percent. I'm good. Uh, really late game for only two units. I'm good. Not really a huge fan of the air tree. And then his R5 is kind of where he gets a lot of people's attention. For one point, you get stun and madness immunity. But this is really where his meat and potatoes are, is his mounted combat and his coalition. But instead of, you know, mounted speed health plus six, it's or mounted units health or something or attack, you get speed, which uh, I don't know. I don't really... I mean, you could have all the speed in the world, and if you face a Gandalf or a Witch King that have Convener and Initiative, like, goodbye. And it doesn't matter. So uh, I'm just not a huge fan of this. Once again, there's really nothing there to keep my attention. Like, for one point, that's pretty astound astounding, but it just it, it falls to the wayside really quickly, in my opinion. Um, 
for a guy about grandma. This is respect five, by the way. I think Legolas definitely has a place, respect five. Because uh, he can actually be, he's one of the few commanders, I think, that can honestly go to, go to a really low respect level and never have to go over it. You can get uh, Legolas to respect three and never have to take him over that. And I think that's one of his strengths. This is how you do them. You skill them here. You skill them here. And if you want to go into, you want to go a few more points higher. You can go to Dwarf Friend, which is really cool. And you can get this, and you can have a Dwarven or an Elven backline and a Dwarven frontline, and it's very cool. My problem with this is um, this is a RNG chance, which it's 50%. It's not bad, but RNG chance, RNG chance. So like three points of of a decent damage all come from RNG chance, where I think he. I think there's, you know, some irritation there with that. Because you can't always rely on that. Gimli, I think, is definitely meta. And I think one of the reasons Gimli is meta is because he has, you know, uh, he is the first dwarf to have two really good skills. Like you, can, you don't really have to go into... He's got the same R0 and R3 tree top as Dwalin, which is cool. But he's got two nifty skills here that allow him to break defense, going tearing through physical armor, and cancel heals. So if, prime example, if a Gimli were to fight... Where is it at? If a Gimli were to fight this Denethor, and say your Denethor was, you know, we'll go to Imrahil. If your Gimli was to fight the Denethor and stopped his ability to heal... That'd be 22 points wasted for one, for essentially two here and one there by Gimli. So 22-point investment, three-point investment, and, and Gimli just shuts this down. So I mean, you could say that easily about Arwen too, which, which for sure, but at least Arwen's heals are more consistent. That's not even like that's 22 points for maybe a chance. So I really like this. I think he shines more fighting good, good v. good, honestly, with his heal cancel and his defense break. But there's definitely a place for him in the non-RP meta as well. I think Ammer is usable. Um, once again, these are this is strictly R5. I, I think he's got a pretty decent kit. Um, he's definitely someone that wants to do both commander damage and troop damage. Uh, I think he definitely inclines more towards commander damage, which is a good thing. Um, and this is how I would build him to give him the bonus damage, to give him the attack vitals, marshal a mark for the speed increase, swing for the double two, one round cooldown, double target attack, and then Rohirrim mainly because I want the additional might, and then I want to access cleave. And you want to, you really want to skill in the in the way that marshal the mark procs for the plus speed, which then goes into the cleave that is modifies is modified by speed. Um, but my other problem with him is that he he works pretty well as a damage commander, and he also works decently well, decently well as a cav commander. But you've got. You've got 15 points here, 7 here, 15 points here, 7 here. So then you can start going into you can start going into his uh, damage stuff. I think he's better than Eowyn, per se, but he's not as good as Theoden. And that's kind of my problem, is if you have the option to go in. If, it's just gonna, if you're just the kind of person who's going to take him to R5 and not go after Uniques, I could not see investing in Theoden. Or excuse me, I could not see investing in Ammer over Theoden. And no offense, but consequently, I could not see investing in Ammer if you're already investing in, in AON because she's a tier one and she's cheaper to respect up. So that's part of my reason why I've got him as somebody who I think is very usable, but he's I would not consider him meta by by comparison to other I would not consider him meta by comparison to Theoden or AON in terms of either just raw strength or in AON's case, the cheapness of her, the fact that she's a tier one. Um um, 
Frodo and Sam, there is something to be said about using them, but it's just too inconsistent and it's a meme build. It's I've seen people who go into Spec and R5, go in to take these skills, and then go hunt Witch Kings. And they'll do a fair bit of damage, but you're not clearing any armies. You're, what you're doing is you're going to send a half army to go fight a Witch King, probably do some decent damage, but the reality is, is that you're having to spend the time equipping the army, marching the army, microing the attack, hoping that the guy doesn't use clairvoyance or some other skill to deduce what you're doing. And then, you know, there's no guarantee you could face a commander that has madness protection. At least as far as the Ring of Terror goes. Obviously, he can't deny it all because um, it's going to affect the enemy commander. Um, but yeah, it's just it's too much RNG. It's too much too much for a meme, and I, I'm not really a big fan of memes because that's that's the territory of people who spend or people who are just not invested into playing the game that much. So they're they're like they want to have fun, but they're usually not the kind of guys who like I don't want to speak ill of everyone else, but like if I'm gonna see somebody who's running a Marion or excuse me a Frodo and Sam, and it's level 35, 40, and they're fighting and fighting Witch Kings, like, I would wonder what, like, where are your other commanders at? Like, what, where, where, like, where else are you focused? Like, if you have the time to do that, where are we at with our objectives as a fellowship? So, for me, it's kind of one of those things where I, I get it, it's funny to watch, but it's just not something I would invest in personally. Um, um, Aragorn 2. Wait a minute. I think he's got a pretty solid kit. You've got a double target, two round cooldown attack. You've got a. Oh, all damage has a 50% chance of gaining. So I think our RTS Mobile likes to say if it's 50% over 10 rounds and you're gaining 50% damage, then you can average it out to 25%, I think. I think it's R3 tree is nothing. It's nothing too crazy, but the nice thing is you do get a rush attack. You do get a pursuit attack. And the nice thing is you can go right into his R5 and kind of just chill there because it gives him additional skill damage from all these individual attacks. It also gives him initiative. And then one point usually in there. So um, I think he's solid. I don't think he has anything particularly awesomely niche about him that uh, Gimli does with the Gimli's heal cancel and defense break. Uh, granted, he does have a rush, but I would actually probably put maybe arguably, arguably, at just strictly R5, I would probably even put Legolas higher. And the reason I say that is because... Where's that? Because two reasons. One is that his title has a nice enemy debuff, kind of like the disarm that Boromir has, and also has Mirkwood Ambush, where there's a chance that it could be poison damage. In that case, it bypasses all the defense. And then there's a bunch of... And this is this is the thing where, like, I'm not a big fan of RNG, but there is a lot of nice RNG factors here. Um, with the dual blows, with the Elven Prince with the attack vitals. So I think that edges him out a little bit above Aragorn, just in terms of RP and respect five. Um, oh, I think I think Balin is usable. I think Balin's one of the more expensive T2 commanders because what I've seen him work with the most is a retaliate build. And I think that's absolutely dog shit that to make a commander viable, you'd have to give him a gold weapon. This is the way I've seen him work. Is a Matic of the Iron Hills, usually strengthened and refined a bit, with retaliate. Allied melee units, blah, blah, blah. And what that does is, is that when his units are retaliating, it allows him, if properly specced, and by properly I mean the, the, the way this build has worked, is the retaliate affects his, um, or Prox's Lord of Moria skill to where there's a 30% chance, max is 35, to recover. And also you'd usually go into Dwarven Leader and you might go into Warrior of the Lonely Mountain and you'd go into Revivalist so you have double recover and there's inspiration involved. So, you know, there's, there's some viability there, but 
for me, it's very specific. You have to run dwarves, and you have to run this gold weapon to give him a lot of pep in his step. Otherwise, I've just seen people crumble. I've seen too many people crumble with a, with a ball, and there's not enough healing there. There's not enough of his own damage. Let's see here. Let's see what let's see what the top three have. Retaliate. Okay, they have a Lang instead of a uh, Manic of the Iron Hills. Manic of the Iron Hills. Okay. And what's the next one? Man See, that's my problem. That there's there's no diversity to this commander. So let's put it this way. If you know that every time when hit by enemies, normal attack within range performs a counterattack. So here's my issue. If you come up against a commander that has one single melee unit and the rest range, you're going to have a severe limitation on how many times that retaliate is going to proc. Whereas opposed to if you're fighting a cavalry commander or somebody with all melee units, you might do better with that. But yeah, it just it's too specific. It's dwarven units and a gold weapon. For me, it's it's too narrow to to want to recommend uh, for people to use at, at like a, over over like an even an ammer. At least an ammer you get guaranteed heals, and once you put enough points in there, and you actually do some considerate troop damage. So let's see here. Let's kind of wrap this up a little bit quick. Uh, Theoden is second, to me, is the second meta, uh, second best meta, tier two meta commander. And that's his kit. I don't need to say too much. People know who he is, um, and they're not they're not afraid to use him. They're, they're not averse to using him. They know that he's worth investing in. I mean, okay. Go here, go here, go here, go there, go there. Go oh, there. He adds a ridiculous amount of base attack. He adds health. He debuffs the enemy permanently. He heals the troops every round. He buffs the damage up to three stacks. He mitigates damage to allow this to heal better. And he has a chance to proc uh, an insane amount of damage. Not an insane. He has a chance to proc a large amount of damage from his attacks. Nothing more needs to be said about that. If you play in Gondor or Rohan, or, or even if you're, um, even if you want to play in Erebor and you're going to get Goat Riders still within that first quarter, um, that's pretty strong. Um. I think Kelborn has use in the meta for RP. Uh, my irritation, though, is that he is a commander that has a particular, like his R5 title is designated towards strictly a particular faction. And i not the hugest fan of that, but I understand. And I can just let it go because um, he's got a pretty solid kit. For one point, he has a series of events, that, a series of uh, effects that he can get depending on his focus level. That's pretty damn strong. You can get solid physical damage mitigation with the magical barrier. It's not really mitigation, but you can up your de defense by quite a bit, and it's modifiable by focus. I think any skills or abilities, whether it's healing or, or defense increase, that is modifiable by focus is huge. It's huge. It's a leg up. He gets guide, which is a huge burst. He gets pursuit, which is a huge burst. He does get a pinch of healing. His R3 tree, like the main title's crap, in my opinion, but the sub skills. Our mitigation, our damage increase, and is our five is mitigation damage increase, follow up, which is crap, and then a uh, tier four loth specific bonus. So it's not bad. I do think he, I do think he has enough to put him in the meta. Well, you know, what? I'm gonna put him in usable because it does require a very particular faction. And I think that's that's all, that's on the same par as requiring a specific gold gold item. I think Eladin's usable. I think he's very much usable because of the buff that they did to both his R5 and half Elven. Half Elven's gotten really strong. That if you run a full Elf uh, Elf line, you get 30% damage uh, increase. And there's other benefits if you run it men and mixed. Coalition's pretty strong. Boon's strong. Um, Granted, it's very particular. Like, Boone is good against facing physical damage, which if you're RP and you're facing good units, that's typically what you'll, you know, good factions, you'll typically run into that. So I think his Elven Rider is pretty strong. Uh, commander and all mounted units and 
increase by 15% damage. I think it's pretty nifty. I think it used to be just elven elven troops, or elven, had to include elven mounted horses, but this is pretty good. Um, and then another 21% from there. So there's, there's really not a whole lot of healing or mitigation. You get a little bit of reinforcement, which I don't care for, but... Um, and you get some mitigation here, but there's just not enough healing mitigation to compare him to Elro here or Arwen. But I do think he's very much a glass cannon that has potential. But I, that that to me would just limit him to the usable to the usable uh, level. Speaking of his brother, I think Elro here is the upper echelon of usable. And I say that because he can easily be used from the first hour of the day, the first hour of the season, to the very last. I think he's got, uh, the nice thing is he's got War Chant, which is the Mary Pippin um, heal tree. And it's got plus 30%. All rounds, or each round, all allied units. He's got the Half Elven for Boon Coalition, which is great. And his R5 is nice because it's plus 15% permanently, and then plus an additional 5% for each race. And then you've got a physical, or excuse me, you've got a blanket damage reduction of 14 points if you want to go into shield training. So I think it's pretty strong. Running him with like a, a men front line, like ideally I would love to see him in Arnor running uh, Rangers of the North as the man, men line. And then um, Sentinels, maybe Bow Knights or Sentinels Marksmen or Sentinels Sharpshooters is the double, double range back line. But yeah, I think he's got a lot of potential. I think he's nice because you can use him in any, any quarter any faction and from start to finish because he has heals. Let's wrap this up. I don't know if I want to use the term meta. Oof. I don't really know. This, once again, this is respect five role play. Now these are going to tweak a little bit once we go into non role play, but I think I think we're safe to say that Falcon is. Personally, I would say probably tied with, with Elro here in my book as far as how awesomely cool he is, but uh, he's got the Musician Tree, which we like. He's got Arid the Weenix uh, Expedition. So the, the only thing with this is that it's Dwarf Dwarves. So he's got very good skills. And he's got troop buff skills, and he's very much just focused on that. Just focus on his troop buffing. But one of the things I really like is that this parry ability is just straight damage reduction. It's not physical, so it can't be bypassed with focus or burn. Um, so actually, I think what I'll do is I'm going to put him just below Elroy here because Falgan's abilities require specifically dwarves, which means if you want to have a best start with him, you're going to start Erebor, whereas Elroy here can really start anywhere. Granted, I would say he's probably best started in, in an Elven or Manish quarter because of his half Elven tree, but you can really use Elra here anywhere. Um, I mean, come on. Do I even need to talk about Gandalf? Do I? Yeah, I don't really think I do. I mean, it's Gandalf the Grey. And then I'm going to say... I'm going to say that Arwen, arguably, in roleplay, would be higher than Aragorn 2 at strictly R5. Um, and that's because she's day one starter to the season end. Um, she does not have any burn reduction, so she can get laid out by Witch Kings. She doesn't have any White Council, so she can, or High Alert, so she can get laid out by Saurons. But she has a lot of healing. The Half Elven gives her a good amount of damage boosts. And she has very strong mitigation with her R5. I just think she's definitely below Gimli because Gimli can can cancel her heals with the skill. And I think she's below Legolas in terms of um, she definitely is somebody who the more respect you have with her, even at R5, you're you're not going to feel like you have enough. So that's my problem. Where Legolas is very tight, where you just needed R3. Um, Arwen needs more and more and more respect. So that's really my opinion on how a, a tier two role play list would look like as far as your utility seizures, your usables, your metas, and your top meta. If we flop this into non-role play but still kept it respect five, I would probably argue that mm, God, that's so tough actually. Hmm. 
there's so many ways you could tweak this depending on where what, what, what commander is being used in what faction. But I think, honestly, I think I might keep this the way it is because these guys are still going to be top of the list. Um, Gimli's going to be strong. Uh, Ammer is still going to need cavalry units. And, uh, I mean, Legolas and Gimli will do well with Muma stacks. Um, A2 is fine with what he's got going on. Yeah, I think that everyone's pretty much fine here. So, yeah, no, I think this would actually stay even in non-roleplay from just a blanket view of not, not looking at specific commanders and specific factions. I mean, to me, that's only a detriment. I mean, there is there is positives about that, but I think I'm just going to look at it as, like, to have to use a commander in a specific faction to get best results, I think that limits is a, is a con, not a pro. So we'll leave it off there, but thank you guys for watching and take care.